Okay, third time lucky, here we go. Hi Yogi and welcome to a slightly different video here on the channel. Uh, today I'm really going to dive a little bit into my background, my life before yoga, how I got into yoga and talk a little bit about how I got into teaching as well. I'll be incorporating some questions that I got from doing an Instagram AMA probably quite a few months ago now. <clears throat> it's just taken me a while to get around to filming this because I am so deeply awkward uh, when it comes to talking about anything other than yoga in front of the camera. So I do predict that there will be a few more jump cuts than you would normally see from me in this video. My apologies. Uh, so let's dive right in. I'll try and keep it short and snappy here. So the first thing I always end up having to kind of clear up when I meet anyone for the first time is usually the fact that I sound really British um, and yet I'm not English at all. Um, I was born in Switzerland and my parents were both children of immigrants who were already born there, but they kind of, uh, on my mum's side, came to Switzerland from Italy during a period of famine. And on my dad's side, they came <clears throat> from Germany during the Second World War. Switzerland was a neutral country at the time and was not accepting any uh, German war refugees. The only reason they were allowed to enter the country is because my grandmother was actually Swiss. And then I guess because both of my parents were not really Swiss, um, I don't think that they ever, even though they would both consider it their home, I don't think they ever felt at home in that culture. So they were always kind of traveling around and looking at different places. And I guess because they both had a background in art, they were very involved in the art and design culture in our hometown in Switzerland. Um, when they visited the Canary Islands, they really fell in love with the climate, but also this one particular island called Lanzarote. It's literally like a volcanic rock with volcanoes all over the place and just black lava ash for land and blue sky, blue ocean, green palm trees, always sunshine. That's actually where I ended up growing up for the majority of my childhood. Um, and because my parents kind of always thought that they would move back to Switzerland at a later point, I needed to be able to speak and write in German so they sent me to the only school that taught German language at the time, and that happened to be a British Hispanic school. So that's how I ended up with this accent. Um, as you might be able to guess, I speak four languages, which is pretty standard, I would say, for Swiss people, but I kind of speak the wrong four languages for Switzerland. So uh, I'm fluent in, of course, Swiss dialect, German, English, and Spanish, which, uh, was of course is the local language in Lanzarote. So for the past 13 years I've been living in London. I originally came here to do my university degrees in animation and illustration and I guess because I've been here for such a long time now at this point I'm actually losing my ability to speak any of the other languages aside from English. My vocabulary is just sort of like dissipating into thin air. Also, I speak immer noch Schweizerdeutsch am Telefon mit meiner Mutter oder wenn ich vielleicht zwei Wochen im Jahr äh, daheim bin. Aber sonst eigentlich nicht wirklich. Äh, ich denke, für die meisten Deutschen ist es ziemlich faszinierend, dass ich Hochdeutsch sprechen kann ohne einen Schweizer Akzent. Äh, das kommt einfach daher, dass ich eine deutsche Deutschlehrerin hatte und die meisten Schweizer haben einen schweizerischen Deutschlehrer, was nicht gerade besonders viel Sinn macht, weil der Akzent einfach immer weitergeleitet wird. Um, y claro que aún puedo hablar español, pero siempre me ha dado un poco de vergüenza hablar español porque tengo una mezcla de acentos un poco raros eh, porque viví en las Islas Canarias que tienen un dialecto distinto y mi profesora de español era catalana, así que ella también Tenía un acento peninsulano, pero un poco diferente que la norma. Y por eso, aunque tengo amigos españoles, siempre hablamos en inglés aquí. As you can imagine, there is not that much to do if you're a young person in Lanzarote. You can literally circumnavigate the entire island in four hours with a car. 
Um, so I ended up filling a lot of my spare time with surfing, which was kind of a godsend and I would still sort of describe it as my first love in a way. Um, I really think that there's actually quite a lot of links between surfing and yoga, not just in terms of movement, which is kind of partly what brought me to yoga at the beginning, um, but also in terms of the philosophy. I guess the reason that I sort of wanted to uh, mention that that was really the only movement background that I have before yoga is because I find a lot of yoga teachers tend to come from a dance and gymnastics background. So a lot of the things that I can do, such as arm balances and things like that, have been really hard won for me. Whereas my flexibility, I would say, is less so the case because I have a thing called hypermobility syndrome. So my body produces defective uh, collagen which kind of just affects all the connective tissue in your body, so every ligament, uh, all the fascia which connect your muscle tissue together, um, all of that is kind of looser than it should be, so people with hypermobility syndrome tend to be more prone to dislocations, but it also kind of, I guess, from the outside makes us look much more flexible for the most part, although some people have basically the complete opposite experience to me. I would kind of say that actually as a hypermobile person, I'm on the like high functioning end of the spectrum, which I would say, you know, there's a lot of gymnasts, there's a lot of dancers who have the same thing that I have and who perform at kind of like peak levels. And then you also have people who are completely incapable of leaving the house and who are just debilitated by this genetic disorder. Um, so in a way that's a huge uh, blessing but I think as a yoga teacher can be a negative because a lot of people come to yoga wanting to become more flexible and I'm not necessarily the best person to teach them that because my flexibility is not healthy if that makes sense. So when I moved away from Lanzarote, I didn't really have a way of getting to surfing beaches. It was all kind of too far away or inaccessible. So uh, I kind of had to find a new movement discipline, although that wasn't the main reason that I came or wasn't the initial reason that I came to yoga. So the first class I ever attended was actually because one of my girlfriends at art school had a really big crush on this guy Michael <laughs> um, and for some reason she knew that he would always go to this yoga class which was free on campus and so we literally went there to spy on him um, I don't think he's going to mind me telling this story because Michael and I actually reconnected a couple years ago because as it turned out while I was going through my teacher training uh, Michael had actually moved into a tantric Shaivist ashram and he was working and living there and we were sort of on a very similar path at that point. I actually think I didn't end up going back to yoga class for about a year and a half after that one because I just absolutely hated it. It just was not right for me. But I think retrospectively it's part of what um, has allowed me to never take it personally when people don't like my classes or don't come back to my classes because there was nothing really wrong with that person's way of teaching yoga it just was not right for me personally at that particular time it was very airy fairy hippy dippy and I just didn't connect with that um, sort of form of yoga in a way so I never take it personally and I often say to beginner students who show up in my public classes that look if you don't enjoy my class please don't think that it's the yoga it's probably me like you are going to have to find a teacher who you resonate with whose way of teaching you enjoy so that you actually want to come back to these classes and this practice because the practice itself has so much to offer anyone um so it is worth seeking out the right teachers for you and it's a sort of hard one lesson that I learnt over the years. And again, I didn't end up revisiting yoga until one of my art, other art school friends dragged me to a Bikram studio. I actually ended up staying within Bikram for I think a good four, maybe four and a half years. Uh, and of course, 
Bikram as a style of yoga has had a lot of bad press in recent years. If you haven't already, then I do encourage you to actually watch the Netflix documentary on him because it sort of covers the whole thing and I don't really want to go into it because I never really met him, so I don't know. If you don't know anything about Bikram, then you do it in a very hot room where the room is heated to around 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, every time you practice and you do the same 26 postures in every single class and in my case at a certain point I was actually practicing five or six times a week um, so whether it's because I was doing the same movements every time or whether it was the hot room or the fact that I had hypermobility without at that point knowing it maybe a combination of all of those I did honestly deal with a lot of injuries during my time in Bikram I had like pulled my hamstring attachment and all sorts of other things that were just probably happening every three months or so which just seemed really excessive at the time um, and I also happened to move from one part of London to another at that point so it was kind of a good opportunity to sort of reassess whether I wanted to stay in hot yoga. I spent probably about a year, year and a half actually just going to a bunch of different studios across London, practicing with different teachers, different styles, and eventually realized that the studio that was closest to my new flat was where I should have been this entire time. Um, and that's where I found the teachers who trained me to become a teacher in the end, and I still practice with a lot of those same people. I did spend a little bit of time in the in-between within Ashtanga Yoga. I'd say that for me, the positives of actually practicing within more traditional styles of yoga have been that they give you a very solid foundation in the practice and also make you super disciplined. Um, when you're doing the same postures over and over, you really have to keep your focus and mind in the game so that you can keep things interesting because you kind of start to realize that whenever you practice, depending on the hour, the day, the month, the time of the month, if you're a woman, uh, those postures feel wildly different. And that's kind of what kept it interesting for me throughout that period of time. Um, and I would also say that if you're practicing the same thing over and over, your body is very fast to adapt. So you start to see the changes happen a lot quicker and you start to see yourself progress. And you also are constantly able to compare yourself from week to week, which is actually kind of helpful at the beginning. So even though I wouldn't practice those styles of yoga now, I actually don't look back on them in a negative light at all. And I think at that point I had been practicing yoga for about eight, almost nine years. Um, and I just found myself having a lot of questions that were sort of beyond the scope of a normal class, which is why I started looking into doing my teacher training, predominantly to deepen my own understanding of the practice. Um, and realistically, because of that reason, there was only one training that I wanted to do, which was the foundational 200 hours yoga campus training that most of my teachers at that point had either gone through or they were teaching on the training itself. The sort of interesting thing about the yoga campus training was that it wasn't attached to any lineage. All of our teachers came from different backgrounds. I would say that there were a couple of things about that training that were super helpful to me. For one thing, the sort of focus on anatomy was really beneficial to me as a new teacher because it gave me something to kind of almost like grab onto and run with as themes for my classes, but also to give little tidbits of knowledge I could share with my students. And the other thing was the fact that they asked us to set up our own classes after the first six months of our training. So we actually had to go out and teach, um, which really helped me find my teaching voice, which I didn't actually think I had that in me. Um, and it also made me realize that I really, really love teaching. I personally set up a community class within my local area which a bunch of my neighbors just showed up to and I think it was just baffling to me as a new teacher that these people who I had never met would put their faith in me to teach them and to improve their well-being um, and I just it made me feel a really deep sense of responsibility towards my students 
and I really loved the community that formed around those classes. The people that showed up to them were just the most amazing people I may have ever met. Um, they are so dedicated, so consistent in their practice, and it really just blew me away. A lot of the people who were sort of the very early uh, students that I had are still with me three years later, which I, is just kind of mind bending to me. It's a lot more than just a job that I show up to. It really is kind of brings so much fulfillment to my life to pass this tradition on to the next set of students who hopefully will uh, sort of find their own version of the practice within them. And I would say thirdly, the other important thing that happened during that course is that I met the person that I would now consider my main teacher, which is Yogi Raj Katrina Repka. Um, and she came from a fairly modern lineage that was only founded, I think, in the 1960s. Uh, which is Ishta Yoga, so it stands for the Integrated Science of Hatha Tantra and Ayurveda, although uh, the word Ishta is also a Sanskrit word that sort of loosely translates as that which resonates with the individual self. And I think that's quite a good description of, of the Ishta approach to yoga, because really it sort of focuses as much as possible on making the yoga practice as specific to each individual student as you can. So we take aspects from Ayurvedic tradition, uh, from tantric meditation, from Hatha yoga, as well as philosophical texts within those realms um, in order to sort of tailor the yoga practice to our students. Uh, which I think is really what the essence of yoga is. So I transitioned into the Ishta lineage and that's where I'm currently doing my advanced teacher training. We were supposed to actually finish in July, but that's not gonna happen. The other thing that's had quite a big impact on my teaching is that, I'd say probably about two years ago, I was having a lot of shoulder issues that because of the knowledge that I'd gained from my first training, I knew that these shoulder issues were predominantly caused by the fact that in yoga we do a lot of pushing movements and almost no pulling movements. So I knew that there was a muscular imbalance in my shoulder joint um, and it was actually causing me some kind of nerve pain. My shoulders would oftentimes feel as though someone was just holding an ice pack to them. So I was kind of thinking about how I could incorporate more pulling movements into my daily or weekly routine and eventually landed on CrossFit because I felt that there was a big variety of movement within CrossFit um, and there was also a very, very similar sense of community spirit that we have in yoga practice. So then I ended up joining a CrossFit gym nearby and I would say probably almost a year into those classes I just realized that I was always a lot more keen on the workouts that had weightlifting in them than I was anything else so I sort of decided to embrace that fact and I started to join the Olympic style weightlifting classes that they had there and I would say I was quite surprised that the weightlifting community was actually more welcoming than I would say the CrossFit or yoga community are. Um, there were certainly some people who at the beginning want to see if you can stick it out because it is such a difficult discipline. Uh, it takes a lot of repetition and technique and sort of perfecting things slowly over time with a lot of dedication, hard work and hours that you put in. But I think in the in-between, um, people are so supportive of one another and I think it always comes from such a genuine place. And I think also as a woman, like I have certainly had my history of disordered eating and eating disorders. So kind of understanding that the number that you weigh on the scale is not necessarily related to how you look and starting to sort of become more interested in putting more kilos on your barbell than you are worried about losing kilos in your body I think was quite a healthy shift in mindset for me personally um, that I think 
yoga has not always been the best at kind of facilitating that healing process for me. Um, if anything, you know, I've had negative experiences and negative comments made about my weight in within the yoga community. And I also found that once I stopped coming to yoga for my physical exercise, um, it really revealed a deeper layer of the practice to me. I came to my yoga practice with much more openness and no kind of ulterior motives, which allowed me to actually discover new aspects to yoga and meditation that I didn't know were possible and I didn't think were there before. I never, you know, I just sort of failed to see those aspects. So in many ways, I felt that weightlifting was uh, almost like the final puzzle piece to get me to where I am right now in my life, in my yoga journey and my teaching journey, which is still fairly fresh because I've only been teaching for three years-ish right now. Um, and the rest is kind of all up in the air. Like most people, I think, we're sort of living through a really strange time with the virus going around. And I personally did not get my leave to remain visa approved. Uh, even though I've been here for 13 years, there's apparently not enough uh, proof that I've been living in this country. So I'm having to submit more paperwork. And if I don't get approved, I might have to move back to Switzerland. Who knows? Um, it's all kind of up in the air, but I'm very sort of kesera sera about it and just kind of seeing where life takes me right now. And hopefully I can take you guys along for some of that ride. I hope I haven't gone on too many tangents and rambled on for ever and ever. Um, maybe there was something of interest in there for some of you. Um, of course, if you made it this far and you like this video, then give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Share it with your friends, spread the good, good word. Uh, if you have any questions that I didn't get around to answering here, then please pop them in the comments section down below. Um, I had a couple of yoga questions that were mixed in with the AMA questions, so I'll get around to them at a later point in a different video. Um, for now, this is it, and hopefully I will see you back on the mat next week when it's slightly less hot in London uh, so that we can get back to our practice. Um, so I hope to see you then, Yogi, and thank you so, so much for joining me today. Bye.